On the 31st of August, 1939, a 43-year-old man was drugged unconscious, dressed in a Polish uniform, and shot dead in the control room of a radio station outside the town of Gliwice in Upper Silesia. His name was Franz Honiok, and he would be the first official casualty of the Second World War. His death would spark a war of the world, even more horrific than the war to end all wars that had rocked it 20 years earlier. The Second World War was the world's first truly global war. It involved 100 million soldiers and was fought on every continent on the planet. At least 50 million soldiers and civilians would be killed, though we will never be certain how many actually died. You might assume it wouldn't be a problem in collecting statistics, but in fact it was very difficult to get accurate figures of every single person who had been killed. Whether you're looking at casualties, fatalities, civilians, people who fought, we're looking at a time of such chaos. There were no records of a lot of these people as they lived, so there was no record of them when they died. So it requires a careful amount of intelligent reconstruction where we don't have accurate figures. It's really more about understanding a period and getting as close as you can based on the evidence that actually exists. And here is where the numbers can help us. It's numbers that drive this story, because when you dig deep into them, it's only then that you can look at the decisions that the generals, the diplomats, the politicians were actually facing, and then you can see the crucial decisions that they had to take. Numbers can help us understand how appeasement came about, why Hitler was so obsessed with the Russian Caucasus, why the Americans dropped the atomic bomb, and numbers would also create the circumstances that led to the conflict in the first place. Because the story of how the Second World War came about is a story of terrible hardships and missed opportunities, driven by harsh economic numbers. It's a story of cynical promises made to very desperate people. And of course, that's as relevant today as it was then. No one could have believed in the last months of the First World War that this world would be engulfed in a conflict even greater than the one they had just endured. The Great War was meant to be the war to end all wars. 17 million people died. And 20 million people were wounded. Nobody in their right minds wanted to go through that again. This was unthinkable. Yet in less than a generation, cold minds full of hatred regarded the post-war settlement with envious eyes and slowly but surely drew their plans against it. One man in particular was warped by disillusionment. Adolf Hitler was a corporal in the German army during the First World War. Like many men who fought in that war, he was immensely traumatised by what he saw. And so it's not entirely surprising that somebody like Adolf Hitler, who had twice been wounded and won an Iron Cross, he would have felt that he had done everything that he possibly could. And yet things hadn't got better after the war, they'd got worse. Who was to blame for this? It wasn't him. Hitler was just one of four million veterans who came home to find no jobs and no hero's welcome waiting for them in Germany. They felt deeply betrayed by the treaty, hashed out at a six-month-long peace conference in the Palace of Versailles between January and June 1919. The Treaty of Versailles was a terrible shock for the German nation, and particularly for those who had fought through the First World War and survived it. The big players there were Britain, France and America. There was no doubt at all that in their minds Germany was responsible and Germany was not going to be given the chance to rise up again and cause any more trouble. Germany's massive army of over four million men is reduced to a mere 100,000. Its navy is limited to warships under 10,000 tons. Its air force is completely disbanded. 
This puts it on a par with the peacetime French army of 106,000. The British have almost four times that number, but they are spread all across the globe. But the British Navy now dwarfs the German fleet by more than five to one. Worse still, Germany is saddled with a reparations bill of 132 billion gold marks. That's worth some 30 billion US dollars. It's something like two times the amount that Germany could produce before the war. And this wasn't just about money. It was also about blame. The French had lost 20,000 factories and more than 700,000 buildings in the First World War. They wanted Germany to admit responsibility, as well as paying for the damage. Perhaps the most difficult thing for Germans to accept was the war guilt clause. And somehow all this awful, hellish war had been Germany's responsibility. And I think that's something that, that German veterans and the German public found almost impossible to accept. This laid the foundations for the myth of the stab in the back, that the German army was never really defeated, that all that had happened is a load of treacherous socialists and communists and Jews um, have been responsible for forcing Germany to give up the war when actually it wasn't beaten. So the Treaty of Versailles was massively important in the impact it had on people's views, but that was because to some extent, in certain quarters, it was decided to make it that important. For millions of unemployed veterans like Adolf Hitler, this was a temptingly seductive explanation for the dire straits in which they now found themselves. When veterans like Hitler looked around, they saw people who apparently were still doing well. So this was the Wall Street jury, the, the, the money men. But equally, the communists, the Bolsheviks, the people that those like Hitler detested on the left, they also were Jews who were somehow in cahoots with the capitalists to do the small man down. The idea that the communists were being funded by Jewish money, and especially American Jewish money, did have um, a credibility in those days. And an amazing number of people were willing to believe this. You fought in the First World War. You were gassed, you were injured, you were wounded in the First World War. And who's getting the benefit uh, of all that you put in? The Jew. Germany is a well of seething resentment just waiting for a firebrand to unleash the anger boiling up within it. And the events that follow Versailles will play right into the conspiracy theorists' hands. Nineteen twenty-three. When Germany fails to pay its reparations bill, the French invade Germany's industrial heartland, the Ruhr, to exact payment in kind. The Weimar government's response to the crisis spirals it into hyperinflation. This is a Reichmark from the German Weimar Republic. At the beginning of the Republic, you would need nine of them to buy one American dollar. By November 1923, because of inflation, you would need 4.3 trillion of them. That would fill this entire marquee. At the time, there were 300 paper mills and 2,000 printing presses producing banknotes just to keep up with the need. Inflation was running at such a rate that people were being paid in wheelbarrows or baskets of money. And there's a story about some women who'd just been paid. They went to the laundrette, they left with their laundry, but they left their money behind. They rushed back, and when they got there, they found the money was on the floor but the baskets had been stolen. So how is Germany going to be saved? How is Germany going to be brought back onto an even keel? Well, the country was bailed out by something called the Doors Plan, by the hook-nosed Jewish financiers that Hitler was railing against. Under the Doors Plan, America pumped some 800 million marks into the German economy. So long as the money kept coming in, Germany could survive. But if anything happened in America to prevent that flow of money from coming in, then Germany would be in big, big trouble. Germany is being propped up by numbers. 
massive American financial numbers, and those numbers will ultimately bring its democracy crashing down. Because on the 24th of October, 1929, Wall Street crashes. There was a saying at the time that if America sneezes, the world catches a cold. Well, actually, the world caught more than a cold. $30 billion was wiped off the value of stocks and shares in the American market. And not just that, $7.8 billion worth of loans in the European markets just disappeared. The Wall Street crash affected all the economies, but Germany crashed fastest and furthest. It had been heavily reliant on American loans. The economy was very fragile. Germany had really rallied economically to the point that it would become the number two exporter in the entire world, second only to Britain. But now, nobody wanted those German goods anymore. So the export figures went down from like 12 billion to, to $5 billion. And of course, what you get is massive unemployment. In October 1929, there were 1.6 million unemployed in Germany, but by 1933, that had leapt to 6 million. One in two families in Germany was affected by unemployment, and so there was desperation for an apparent saviour figure, and Hitler appeared to promise everything. One of the reasons that the Nazi party was so successful is how they communicated their message. They used simple posters like this, and they presented themselves as the Uber party. Number one, drawing people to their membership from the German people. But also, and this may surprise us, is they also presented themselves as a party of social inclusion. The Volk, the people. A woman in Nazi Germany who had more than three babies got financial rewards. But at the same time, they presented themselves as the party that supported, had the back of the workers against, in this case, the bankers and the bureaucrats. And the key thing about the bankers is that they were Jewish. In the East, the Bolsheviks. In the West, the American bankers. And the key thing now is that the party was going to protect the Germans against the Jews. It's all presentation of image. It's all presentation of a massive popularity and national support. And when you look behind the scenes, it's geared towards population expansion, having more people to send to war. And the male is supposed to be the strong, hard male protecting the nation. Something like this had already happened in Italy before the Wall Street crash, with the rise of Benito Mussolini. People often wonder why Hitler admired Mussolini so much. I think you can look back to these early days when Mussolini was the strong man in Italy. In 1922, he had used his black shirt thugs to go in and break up strikes by laborers. A lot of small farmers couldn't afford the extra wage demands demanded by these strikers. And so, of course, when Mussolini and his fascists break up all these strikes, the farmers see fascism as their savior. Hitler watched this happen and realized that he could transfer this to Germany, and that's what he did in Prussia. In 1932, the farmers of Schleswig-Holstein in Prussia overwhelmingly voted Nazi in the parliamentary elections. This helped give Hitler 37% of the seats in the Reichstag. This was a turning point for Hitler. He could be electorally successful. The Depression is absolutely crucial to the rise of Nazism, completely and totally. If you look at the Nazi vote in 1928, meaningless almost. But by the summer of 1932, people are flocking to the Nazis because in those intervening couple of years, the implications of the Wall Street crash have been horrific in Germany. And now suddenly, here comes a leader who makes them feel good again and says they have rights, that they have a future, they have a greatness, a destiny. Hitler now has the numbers in the Reichstag to dictate the balance of power. It proves crucial in January 1933, when the German establishment begins casting round for an alternative to socialist rule after the collapse of their latest government. In all the negotiations that follow, it's the pro-Nazi Agrarian League that persuades Hindenburg that Hitler is a man to be trusted with power. 
So it's Hitler's wooing of that agricultural vote is vital to get him into power. On the 30th of January in 1933, Adolf Hitler is appointed Chancellor of the German Reich. He has taken the economic misery caused by the Great Depression and used it to get the numbers he needed for power. And he's gone right to the brink to get the top job. But the actions of Japan on the other side of the world will convince him he can go much further. And those events will push the world to war. On the 1st of September, 1923, the Great Kanto Plain west of Tokyo in Japan was struck by an earthquake measuring magnitude 7.9 on the Richter scale. 140,000 people were killed. 570,000 buildings were destroyed in the firestorm that followed. The cost of the disaster would cripple the Japanese economy. Before the Kanto earthquake, Japan was one of the great economic success stories from the First World War. During that time, it tripled its industrial output and actually made a profit of some $400 million. The great Kanto earthquake wiped all that out in just one day. Just like Germany, Japan rose to the challenge by modernizing its economy and investing heavily in overseas markets. And then, just like Germany, when the Wall Street crash happened, all that industry collapsed. Lots of young men and women found themselves out of work, including in Japan's relatively impoverished countryside, where a great deal of nationalistic politics became the result. This opened the door to the enemies of progress and drove Japan down the so-called dark valley of imperialism. There is a very strong economic argument to explain Japanese actions in the years leading up to World War II and during World War II itself. Of course, other factors matter greatly as well, but sheer hard numerical calculation of Japan's interest was also at the heart of what that country wanted to do. At the forefront of that argument was the Japanese military. They saw themselves as the bearers of the Japanese nation, and they worried about all those liberal politicians or even socialists and so on who were internationalists, who wanted to collaborate with uh, other, other states. Anything that took Japan away from its proud warrior past was utterly dishonourable. So they looked to China as a natural place for Japanese expansion. They saw it as an area where the Japanese could really move in, secure their resources and interests, and establish a new territorial empire. China was the third largest country in the world. With a population of almost 500 million people, covering a land area of about 4 million square miles, during the 1920s, it was hopelessly divided. Militarist leaders who were in charge of their own, often very substantial armies, controlled different provinces, different parts of China, and were all jostling for control. The Japanese army felt it could exploit these divisions to seize control of the Chinese territory of Manchuria. By 1930, 219,000 Japanese citizens had emigrated to Manchuria, guarded by more than 10,000 soldiers in the so-called Guangdong, or Kwantung Army. Quite frankly, the Kwantung Army were a bunch of warmongering lunatics, and they looked to Manchuria as being an essential element of Japan's imperial destiny. The simple numerical reason for this is oil and natural resources. One of the major problems that Japan had is it didn't have very large natural deposits of commodities which were necessary to create the automobile and aeroplane-based modernized economies that marked the early 20th century. Japan is very poor in oil resources. It imported 90% of its requirements. One of the advantages about expanding into Manchuria uh, was the belief that you could somehow use the shale oil in Manchuria and that this would provide additional resources. To get it, the Kwantung army will have to manufacture a war. At 10 p.m. on the 18th of September, 1931, the Japanese railway line at Mukden in southern Manchuria is attacked by terrorists. The Kwantung army retaliates by opening fire on the Chinese barracks.
They claim that the railway line was attacked by Chinese bandits, but the real saboteurs are the Kwantung troops themselves who had dressed up as Chinese soldiers. And this gives them all the pretext they need to invade Manchuria. Within weeks of the Mukden incident, the Kwantung army has occupied an area the size of France and Germany combined, placing 30 million people under their control. They are behaving like the Nazis, two years before the Nazis had even come to power. Some of Japan's actions in the 1930s do seem to be a foreshadowing of actions that eventually would be undertaken by Adolf Hitler when he became Chancellor of Germany. So think about the invasion of Manchuria in 1931. One of the first reactions of the world community was to send a commission from the League of Nations to actually look at the reality of what had happened. The League of Nations is a forerunner to the United Nations and it's there to try and promote harmony amongst nations. But actually, it's really, really toothless. The adoption of this report would give the impression to the Chinese that they had been exonerated from all responsibility. Although the report condemned the Japanese actions, very little was done. It eventually led to the Japanese actually storming out of the League of Nations in 1933 and essentially opened the doors for a much more violent, much more confrontational style of territorial control. By 1933, the Kwantung army has increased from 10,000 men to 114,000. Emboldened by their success, its officers now in control of Japan turn their sights on China. The seemingly innocuous spark that ignited Japan's war with China happened on the Marco Polo Bridge in Beijing. On the 7th of July, 1937, a Japanese soldier goes missing. Immediately, the Japanese commander on the spot blamed local Chinese troops. A small-scale shooting incident between the two sides broke out. It turns out that the soldier has gone AWOL and reappears just a few hours later. Both sides, the Chinese nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek and the Japanese government in Tokyo, ratcheted up confrontation with each other. And within just a few days, it had escalated to essentially an all-out war between two nations. The Japanese high command is convinced that China will be a walkover. They take their invasion plan to the Emperor Hirohito for approval. One general even tells Hirohito that the war is going to be over in three months. Hirohito's furious about this. That's what you told me at the start of the Manchuria incident, he shouts. But it's not ended for more than four years. The Chinese mainland is as large as the Pacific, so how can you tell me that it's going to be over in three months? Hidebound by convention, the Emperor Hirohito has no choice but to agree the plan. It takes the Japanese army all of the three months they have planned for just to take Shanghai. When it is over, more than 187,000 Chinese have been killed or wounded. The streets of Shanghai were essentially turned into a form of charnel house. Eventually, the Japanese forces did overwhelm the Chinese, but by taking three months, the Chinese showed that they would not give up control of their own country without a severe fight. But Japanese brutality backfires. The Guomindang nationalists of Chiang Kai-shek are so shocked by the Japanese assault that they form an uneasy truce with the communists of Mao Zedong against the Japanese threat. Chiang Kai-shek needs the communists to help counter the Japanese invasion. So ironically, Mao Zedong's Communist Party is actually saved by the Japanese invasion. The United Chinese Army has over two million men, but still the Japanese keep coming. They appear to be unstoppable. It forces Chiang Kai-shek to do the unthinkable. In June 1938, Chiang Kai-shek could see that the Japanese armies were advancing swiftly across central China. But he had one tactic that he could use to try and prevent their advance, and that was to create an artificial flood. And he would do that by blowing apart the dikes which held back the mighty Yellow River at the town of Huayuanco. The resulting flood engulfs an area of more than 20,000 square miles drowning 11 towns and over 4,000 villages. Between 500 and 900,000 people were drowned. 
and up to five million more are made homeless. So with this one act, Chiang Kai-shek has killed more Chinese civilians than all the Japanese atrocities in China combined. It's the largest act of environmental warfare in history. The flooding of the Yellow River grinds the Japanese invasion to a halt. Japan now has 34 divisions, totaling 1.1 million men, literally bogged down in China. And it's not over yet. For the Japanese military, there's no question of withdrawing. Once you've occupied an area, these are not things you're going to give up. The Japanese honor, Japan's imperial tradition, requires that once you've occupied territory, you hold on to it. Yet it's painfully clear that Japan's generals have bitten off much more than they can chew. Traditionally, Western historiography dates the beginning of World War II to the invasion of Poland by Hitler in 1939. But I think there's an argument that the real date is 1937, the Marco Polo Bridge incident that opens the war between China and Japan. It's all out war. It becomes a total war. And it doesn't really end until the atomic bombings of Japan in 1945 bring that war to a close. So for the Chinese and the Japanese, World War II in its full phase lasts eight years from 1937 to 1945. Yet despite all of Japan's naked aggression, the Western powers and the League of Nations seem unable or unwilling to stop them. The League of Nations is frankly an utter failure, and it plants one word in Hitler's mind, appeasement. In October 1933, Hitler follows Japan's example and publicly walks out of the League of Nations. At the same time, he begins secretly rearming the nation. Under the Versailles Treaty, Germany was disarmed. Hitler not only regarded this, as did most of the German people, as monstrously unjust, but in order to fulfill his belief in Germans' military destiny, he had to have the means with which to do so. So right from the very start in 33, Hitler tells his government, he tells the armed forces, we're going to rearm in defiance of their size, so we do it secretly until 35. Then you have this accelerated program of rearmament on to the late 1930s. Over the next eight years, Germany spends at least 35 billion Reichsmarks, 14 billion dollars, on rebuilding the army. Between 1933 and 1935, spending on the military as a percentage of total national expenditure rises from 1% to 10%. By 1936, Germany has revealed it is rearming to the rest of the world. It is building an army of 36 infantry divisions, aiming to increase its strength from 100,000 to 600,000 men by 1938. It's about twice the size of the French army which has a paper strength of almost 350,000 men. The numbers are even more uneven in other sectors of the armed forces. Germany has 5,112 aircraft, compared to France's 890. Around 3,400 tanks, compared to 1,300. And though the French Navy is triple the size of the Germans, Hitler signs a naval accord with Great Britain that will allow him to more than double his fleet in the next three years. But the numbers are more than just a comparison. They tell us a lot about the way these countries are thinking. The French really aren't ready for war in the same way that Germany is. The French military is based on a tripartite model, a regular army of 106,000 men, up to 240,000 annual conscripts doing military service and around five million reservists who had completed military service and could be called up in time of emergency. On paper, France can summon up five million men at a moment's notice. But these are reservists, they're old, they're fat. Or they're even working in essential jobs that need to keep the economy going. And if you look at the French economy at this time, it can't afford, actually, to put that army out. And it can't afford to rearm. You've got the workers going on strike, uh, you've got the effects of the Depression hitting France in a, a kind of delayed fashion. And so whereas Germany is this coming power, France actually is more like a sick man. Britain, on the other hand, is in good shape economically. But before 1935, the British High Command is more focused on maintaining the Navy and defending the Empire than building up land forces in Europe. 
British military spending did not rise above £114 million per year until Hitler announced that he was rearming in 1935. The British have their work cut out just policing their empire. They really can't afford to, to build up an effective army in Europe. The people of Western Europe, the French and the British above all, still totally traumatised by the memory of the First World War and all those ghastly casualties. They were desperate to believe that Hitler might be trusted, to believe that a war might be avoided. This is what Hitler is banking on. But he doesn't reveal his thinking until 1937. On Friday, the 5th of November, 1937, Hitler convenes a meeting of all his senior military staff. And this meeting is recorded, and that memorandum famously gets called the Hossbach Memorandum. In it, Hitler outlines the guiding philosophy he has been refining since he first wrote it down, 14 years before. Hitler explains the necessity for German territorial expansion. He calls it Lebensraum, living space. And what he wants to have, like Britain, is an empire. He looked at Britain, he looked at France, well, they've got big empires. Why shouldn't Germany have one too? He makes no bones about the fact that he wants to conquer other territories. To strike east, to create a new empire for Germany in which millions of people would just starve to death while the food from the Ukraine and the crops from Western Russia went to feed the German people. These are populated in his eyes by Untermenschen, people who the Nazis regard as being racially inferior. We are going to use their land, and they can frankly go to hell, or worse. The only thing that can stand in Germany's way are the Western powers of World War I. But Hitler isn't worried about them. Hitler had seen Mussolini walk into Ethiopia in 1935, and the British and French did nothing. And they did nothing again in 31 and 37 when the Japanese walked into China. He'd done a calculation that really, until 1943, they wouldn't be strong enough to stop him. That's really his object. Carve out his version for like a Manchuria or in Ethiopia, and that the other powers will not interfere. Hitler had already tested the ground one year earlier when 10,000 German troops, accompanied by 22,700 armed police, marched into the Rhineland and occupied the territory demilitarized by the Treaty of Versailles. If Germany really was going to be a military power, then it had to be able to, to protect its factories. He needs those factories to produce his tanks and his planes and his weaponry. In order to protect that industrial heartland, Hitler needs to create a buffer zone. And that buffer zone is the demilitarized Rhineland. In retrospect, we can see that Hitler was bluffing, but the French intelligence estimated he had almost 300,000 soldiers in the Rhineland. That would be equivalent to the, to the French army. Quite where the French had got that figure from is anybody's guess. But the British and the French knew that to kick Hitler out of the Rhineland, they would basically need a war, and no one wanted that. In 1938, Hitler followed this up by unifying with Austria. At the same time, Germany, Italy and Japan form the Anti-Comintern Pact, which will eventually become known as the Axis. Hitler is preparing for the conflict that's to come. 1938 is a key turning point. That is the moment of total irreversible radicalization. You see a shift in the army leadership. You see the Anschluss of Austria. In some views, the so-called Kristallnacht, November 9th, 10th, 1938, is the moment when the Holocaust starts. That is when you use brutal physical violence against Jews, and you see that other Germans are not prepared, by and large, to step in to help their fellow Jewish Germans. Hitler was riding his luck, and the next domino he would topple would be Czechoslovakia. But he was a gambler, and sometimes gamblers go too far. And he would go too far in 1939. The Eastern European state of Czechoslovakia was a completely artificial nation, cobbled together out of Czechs, Slovaks, Hungarians and Germans. There are various reasons why Hitler wants to invade Czechoslovakia. For one thing, you have more than three million ethnic Germans who want to liberate, effectively, and the Treaty of Versailles has put them on the wrong side of the border. 
But it's not just the people that Hitler wants, it's also all that industry. The massive Skoda works in Czechoslovakia would be fantastic for Hitler if he wants to rearm. Hitler's idea in the spring of 1938 is that he will have a limited war against the Czechs, that he will invade Czechoslovakia and nobody will stop him. In September 1938, Hitler begins massing troops on the frontier of Czechoslovakia. The world is at a tipping point. Britain's new Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, tries to avert the crisis with a frantic whirlwind of shuttle diplomacy. Hitler knew that Chamberlain wanted to avoid a war. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. When Chamberlain notoriously declared peace for our time, it was peace at the price of Czechoslovakia. And Hitler got every bit of that country that was more than 50% German. And he also got an enormous amount of oil reserves and coal reserves and also industrial output. It was a magnificent coup for Hitler. Some people view it as a total capitulation. Winston Churchill found it demeaning, debasing. Britain was basically getting down on her knees, on her belly, in front of Hitler, allowing him to do whatever he wanted. What none of them realize is that Chamberlain has done the maths, and he knows the numbers are against him in September 1938. He isn't just buying peace, he's playing for time. And Chamberlain isn't the only one who has run the numbers. What's interesting is that the head of MI6 in 1938, Hugh Sinclair, stepped in and said to Chamberlain, if you don't sign appeasement with Hitler, we go to war immediately, and we aren't ready. The infamous Munich Agreement is the soft public face of a bruising negotiation that has been taking place behind the scenes. Chamberlain realizes that if he simply caves into Hitler, the dictator will demand more. He has to make Hitler step back from the brink, then give him just enough to keep him happy. On the 27th of September, Chamberlain sends his personal emissary to, to Hitler in Berlin and says to him that France is going to honor its pledge to Czechoslovakia and you need to know that we will come to the aid of France. When it becomes clear that the British and French really are going to interfere, then Hitler is forced to abandon that little war. He gets a lot, of course, he gets to sedate in German areas and incorporated into Germany. But what he can't have is his little war, and he's furious. Chamberlain desperately hopes that Hitler truly is a man of his word, that he will not expand beyond the land he's been ceded. Chamberlain said to his sister that he hoped Hitler would keep his promise. He's been vilified for having sold Britain out as this weak appeaser, but in fact he was anything but that. We do owe a backhanded debt to Chamberlain, because the one thing for sure, there are a few historians who say um, Britain and France should have fought Hitler in 1938. Um, most of us don't buy that idea at all. If you look at the, the figures at this point, Britain really didn't have many troops who were actually ready to fight at this point. Britain needed more time. Chamberlain knows that the German army has 600,000 men in it. That compares to the British with just 100,000 men in Europe. That's a huge imbalance, and Chamberlain needs the time to correct it. Time finally runs out in March 1939 when Hitler rips up the agreement and marches into the rest of Czechoslovakia. It's at this point that Chamberlain draws a line in the sand. The relationship between the Munich crisis and the outbreak of the Second World War against Poland is a very close one. In Hitler's mind, he made a mistake. He was let down in 38. This time he's going to have his little war, and Chamberlain and the French will do nothing. Chamberlain was pretty certain that Poland would be next on Hitler's list, and the reason is not difficult to fathom, because in some ways Hitler was just ticking boxes. He was taking back what he felt was taken from Germany at Versailles. And so the Danzig Corridor looked like it was going to be next. The Danzig Corridor was a slice of land that provided access to a seaport for the newly created Polish nation by driving a wedge through Western Prussia. This effectively removed 360,000 Germans from their home nation 
and cut off the two million inhabitants of East Prussia from the rest of Germany. And Hitler wants them back. Chamberlain knows that this has got to stop, and he says to Parliament that Britain will defend Poland if Germany attacks. Hitler hesitates, but it's not Chamberlain who's holding him back. Hitler is basically not scared of Britain and France. But there was another power that he was nervous of, and that's the Soviet Union. As the fate of Poland hangs in the balance, both sides frantically work behind the scenes to get Stalin on their side. But the numbers tell for Hitler. During all this diplomatic horse trading, Stalin said that he would commit 300 divisions to the uh, defence of Poland, and he asked the British ambassador how many the British would do, and the ambassador replies, two, and two later. Unsurprisingly, Stalin chose the Germans. On the 23rd of August, 1939, Russia signs a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany, promising Germany oil supplies and control of Western Prussia in return for all of Eastern Poland. Stalin said that Britain and France had wanted to use the Soviets as hired men without wanting to pay for it. Well, from the Germans, he was going to get Eastern Poland, and the Germans were going to get the Danzig Corridor. Hitler is now certain that the numbers are on his side. He wants his little war. He didn't have it with the Czechs, so he's going to have it with the Poles. And he becomes obsessed with this idea. He tells the generals and his colleagues over and over again, you know, Britain and France are not going to do anything. And so we come to Gleiwitz. Poland's fate is sealed by the murder of Franz Honiok in a nondescript radio station on the Polish-German border. And it's that manufactured evidence that the Germans show the world that the Poles had mounted an attack on their territory. Hitler has used exactly the same ploy that the Japanese used at Mukden to justify his naked aggression against Poland. But he has miscalculated the numbers. Four days later, on the 3rd of September, 1939, Britain and France declare war on Germany. Hitler is furious. It wasn't what he expected. And the following day, he's busy working out his own theory of what happened. And his own theory is that actually it was the Jews who drove the French and the British to war. And that's the only way he can explain to himself how Britain and France finally decided to go to war. What Hitler doesn't actually appreciate is that appeasement isn't just spineless pacifism, this is actually the British buying themselves time. More important still, it's very doubtful indeed whether if Britain had chosen to go to war in 1938 over Czechoslovakia, the dominions Canada, Australia, New Zealand would have come in too. What completely changed by 1939, everyone understood that Neville Chamberlain might be a naive man but he had been a completely honest, honourable man who had striven to make peace with Hitler and by 1939 had been seen to fail. The British people and the Dominions all understood by September 1939 that Hitler must be fought. Hitler could only go so far. When he moved into Poland, enough was enough. By September 39, the British and French had just about mustered the numbers to face down Hitler and take him to war. They're not declaring it as a, as a gesture. They're declaring it because they honestly think they have the military capacity to defeat Germany. By actually pushing his luck too far, Hitler brings war upon himself a good four years earlier than he had expected it. Hitler had come to power thanks to the huge amount of economic misery caused by the Great Depression. He had turned the punishing numbers of the Versailles Treaty into a rallying cry for his people and he had taken the Allies to the brink of appeasement as they scrabbled for the numbers to oppose him. In these, as in so many other ways, numbers lie at the heart of the events that pushed the world to war. It would become another great war driven by numbers. And in the years to come, those numbers would keep on rising.